How many business owners are in the room? Cool, awesome. How many people work? <laughs> Everybody else? How many people work for businesses? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. Awesome. All right, guys in the back, we're ready? All right, here we go. Yeah. You decide to take your hobby and your rights. You decide to build a business you do really well. You dive in and start building a business around your body. You're on fire. Business is fun. You and your business are growing. Your passion is to win 60 hours a day, and you're willing to do whatever it takes to grow your company to the next level. One day you realize you can work for a long time in your business and can make more money working for somebody else. team performed like that? What if your team performed like that every day? How is it that sports teams like the Patriots and Bruins, the Red Sox, of course, all teams from New England, do so well? Yeah, New England. <laughs> what is it about them that makes teams so successful? Why is your team not performing like the Patriots or the other sports teams that are out there and such high performers? What do you think is the difference? Today, we're going to go over some of the things that you could implement in your business to get your business performing like the Patriots or your favorite team. I'm Kurt Harrington, better known as the Fish Guy. I started Something Fishy, a design installation and maintenance company at the age of 15. I started cleaning fish tanks with my twin brother who's back here in the room at uh, charging $12 for our first client. I service one month. At, from the age of 15 to 17 while in high school, I grew the business to earn $50,000 as a senior in high school. At that point, I was going to college and not have to work. I had earned money through the business and decided that was, that was what I was going to do. I was so excited in high school and what I had accomplished, and I had a and also obviously for fish, and decided to keep the business while I was in school. A couple of years later, I left college doing $150,000 in business and decided it was time to start hiring a few people. I did that, I was working full time on the business and hired a couple of people, I was doing, providing them a little bit of training and we grew at 100% in three consecutive years. About that time I was sitting in my accountant's office and he looked at me and he said, Kurt, you're a pretty talented guy. You're pretty smart, and you've got some good things going on for you. But you know you can make a lot more money if you're working for somebody else. Are you serious? What was I doing wrong? How could that be? I grew a business at 21, 22, 23 years old at 100% year over year. That's incredible. My accountant looked at me and said, yeah, but you're not making any money. You're just above bankrupt. What did I have to do? I didn't understand. How could I be working so hard? I was working 80, 90 hours a day. My solution to everything was working harder. I remember writing, one week writing my hours down, 117 hours. I remember walking into a medical office at 2 in the morning to clean their fish tank. I turned the lights on, I looked at the fish tank, I'm like, oh my god, they're all dead. No, that's how I learned how fish do sleep at night. They're just floating and resting. It's not normal to be cleaning fish tanks at 2 in the morning, but you do whatever it takes. Because working harder was my solution to making the business work. It was at that point that I realized 
I needed the solution to prove my accountant wrong, that I didn't need a job, and that I could keep my entrepreneurial spirit and my passion for business going, was that I needed to work on my business and not just in it. But I was just myself and a couple of team players. I had to still be out there in the road. I still had to have my hands wet. I still had a passion for that. So it became time to focus on my business, after hours, nights, weekends. Take care of the customers during the day. Take care of the weeds of your business during the day. And I slowly transitioned to a little bit of working on my business, and then continually, even to this day, continue to add more and more to working on my business. And that's how we've been able to scale. And I'm going to share some practices with you today so that you guys, if you're in business, can work with your teams and your peers to do the same thing if you own a business. Likewise, you guys can take your business to the next level if you learn how to start working on your business and not just in it. One of the things that I learned was that individuals don't build companies. As CEOs, as entrepreneurs, as hobbyists that are so passionate, we're going to get into this business, we're going to start a business, we're a retail owner, we're a service company, it doesn't matter what you're doing. We think it's all on us. We have to scale the company. I'm just going to hire Tommy and Jenny just to clean fish tanks and help out or bring customers out. No, that's not what it's all about. That might be their job role, but everybody on your team needs to be responsible for growing the company. Companies don't grow by individuals, companies grow by teams. And when I learned this, we totally shifted our business around and made it to the success that we've built today. You guys can do the same things, and if you want to scale your business, you're going to need to do the same things. So let's dissect how sports are played and how, what is it that makes sports teams so successful? Well, first of all, as a young kid, you, are, you want to get into, the, into athletes, you want to be successful, whether it's in grade school or you want to go do it in college, you want to make your college paid for by sports. What are you doing? You start by being prepared emotionally and physically. You're practicing, you're working hard, you're dedicated to your self improvement, you're doing it every day. And that only leads you to tryouts, right? And at tryouts, you're lucky if you can actually make it to the team. If you are one of the few that practice harder than anybody else, you might actually get on the team. And then what happens when you're on the team? You're the new guy or girl on that team, and what position are you playing in? You're warming the bench. Are you disappointed that you're warming the bench, or are you excited for what your future has to hold for you? You want to be the best bench warmer, right? You don't want to complain that you're in a position you didn't want that position but you know that's where you need to be to get to the next level. So you're on the bench, and what do you do? You keep practicing. You don't only practice with your team. When the team says to show up, you're practicing at home. You're practicing at night. You're skipping Friday night activities and going to the gym. You're practicing more on your own than you are with your team. And your team will notice that. Still, you're still sitting on the bench. As hard as you're practicing, as much as you're investing, you're still on that bench. Finally, the coach is on your ass, giving you a hard time, trying to toughen you up, trying to get you ready for the game. He's giving you tough feedback, tough feedback that you don't want to hear. But fortunately, you know that listening to the coach, implementing the things that the coach is telling you to do, will make you successful. He or she, your coach, has the experience that you want. And if you're listening to them, that's your belief for getting to the next level. So it's at practice that you get noticed because your coach sees that you're actually listening and executing. You're actually doing things in practice that he wishes were happening on the field during playtime. Once you get noticed, you finally get some playtime. After you get some playtime, you are practicing as hard as ever. Just because you're now out on the field does not mean you give up practice. You're still training, you're still working hard. You want to be successful in front of your peers. So your practice never ends. You play really hard, you earn more playtime, and then you become the MVP. Is this not the road that every successful athlete takes, whether you're in high school or you're playing professional football? All the way up to the NFL. If that's your dream, you gotta put the time in. So why is it that companies aren't built that way? Let's take a look at typical companies and how they're structured. We're really busy at work. We have a lot going on. We just sold a big job. We need to hire somebody. Let's find anybody with a heartbeat. 
We are so desperate to, because somebody just walked out the door to get somebody in this building and to make sure that they can, we can put them in a van and go service fish tanks or whatever position or whatever company you're in. That's the wrong attitude. You need to, you need to, that is going to drive uh, you throwing that individual into the fire. And we've all done it. I've done it and every one of you has done it. Every one of you that's in a business has seen it happen to one of your peers. We hire the new guy or girl, we throw them into the fire. Here, why don't you go hang out with this person and shadow them for a little bit. Shadowing is not training. It's a good observation period, but unless the person that is providing the training is trained on how to train, they're not getting the training that they're looking for. And what happens after you, out of desperation, hire somebody, put them into the field or into the position, have them look at what someone else is doing, then all of a sudden, if you're a couple months in, and your expectations aren't met. You hired this person to create less stress in your company. You needed someone to fill roles and, put, and fill orders and service appointments. But instead, you've just created more chaos in your business. It's not easier for you that you hired someone. It's harder for you. This is not the way that you should build your team if you want a company that's going to be successful and is going to grow and scale. Let's take a look at how sports teams are built and what if we mimic that in our own companies. What would that look like? What would our hires look like? Well, what we do at Something Fishy is a little bit different than most people. It's harder, but the results are well worth it. When we decide that we're going to hire someone, the first thing that we do is post something that is a little bit different than what most people would post. We're not just hiring, we're looking for the right person. Are you a cultural fit? Are you going to Personally, do you have the soft skills that are needed to be successful on our team? The technical skills we're looking for are way down the bottom because we can train them. We want good people on our team. We want athletes that are out there practicing. So we invest in that interview. One thing that, one tip that I always like to share is hire slow and fire fast. When you hire someone, you want to be methodical. You want to be purposeful. You want to be intentful. Once you know that you have a bad apple on your team, it's not going to get better. If you realize you can't coach them up, then you need to coach them out. Get them off the team because they're also affecting the other peers, the other team players. In sports, you see that. Sports players will work the bad apple out of the team on their own. The coach probably doesn't even need to be involved in that. In companies, they typically hide that, and they, they start getting gossip about why Tommy's not performing so well. You, and you know as the coach or the leader, and you're not doing anything about it. Fire fast, that bad apple will ruin the bunch. We interview like tryouts at something fishy. When you come into an interview, it's only after we've received your resume and it better have a cover letter that tells you us about you and why you want to join the team at something fishy. And it better not be a generic cover letter that's sent to everybody. It better be something that, that proves that you researched who we are and what we're doing. We just made a hire two months ago and the cover letter was flawless. They reached, they fortunately were able to reach out to a team member in our company and learn a little bit about us. And then they probably spent three or four hours writing a one-page cover letter. And they detailed the asset that they would be to our company and the experience that they had that would bring them up to, to par with our team. And that interview went very, very well. They put the effort in. Another thing that we do is when you do send us your information, I want to work on your team, the first thing we do is see if you want to practice and put some effort in. We send back a bounce back email with five or six questions. What are some of the things that we're asking you? What's your favorite superhero? Why would that be important? We just want to know how you think. How about what are three characteristics that you expect of your manager when you join our team? See if our management team is, is right for you. We ask questions like that, number one, to if we doubt at least half the people won't even respond to that. And those aren't people that we want to hear. And then when we do see those answers come back, we see the ones that are three or four you know, words, responses, and then we see ones that people put time in, they're practicing. Those are the people that we hire. We build a culture of practice in our organization, both inside and outside of work hours. Going back to the sports team, how many hours are spent on the field doing practice, scheduled practices with your teams? Whatever that number is, those athletes are practicing even harder on their own time. You all know that. Is that happening in your company? Are you encouraging your team to be practicing all the time? We have team members here at Mackinac. 
we have a professional development budget to help them along the way. Our team members that showed up here for MACNA, we didn't pay their way. We paid some of it, we helped them. We wanted them to make sure they were willing to invest in their own practice as much as we were willing to invest in them. Now we got a couple more days of practice because I'm doing it, so we'll be here a little longer. <laughs> Um, that practice time is so important. It's important to make sure your team is on board. Yeah, we can invest in you and make you better, and we're willing to do that. But we're not willing to do it unless you're willing to invest in yourself. And that's something that's really important to see in every great athlete out there. Why aren't you seeing it in your team and your team players? They need to be investing in themselves. Not only did our team invest in themselves to get here, two of them put on a session yesterday, and they did an incredible job educating other Mac people here today. It was unbelievable what they did. The cool thing about preaching on practice is that they started, they're two marine biologists. They're science people. They don't have, they are not naturally comfortable up here. How did they get to the stage and be so successful? Not only this year, but also last year. Because it started in our company building a culture of practice. Hey, we're in a meeting, can you come up again and speak for five minutes? and teach us something, because you're brilliant. And then five minutes turned into the next meeting, maybe it was 10. And then we did a one hour seminar along with Billy here yesterday, it was completely successful. Very cool stuff. You need to have a culture of practice. You tend, as your company grows, you will hire people, hopefully, that are smarter than you, brighter than you, bringing things to the table that you are not even informed of or knowledge of love. That's why you hire them. You want to bring people that are better than you, right? Even for those people, while they might be bringing a technical aspect to you and to your team, make sure that they have training skills. They need to know about your culture. They need to know about your process. What is, what is the vibe that something Fisher in your team? You need to make sure even the most experienced hires are providing training and are well acclimated to your company. So a lot of people, as I'm talking about training, will be thinking, Man, what if I train these people and they leave? What if they go to my competitors? What if they start their own company? I'm dead. You know what, there's a lot of business practices you can instill to support that not happening. One of them will be your culture. Let me ask you this, as much as you're worried about training someone and investing in someone and they leave, what happens if you don't train them instead? What's that going to do? You're delivering services with, to your customers and the person's not trained properly? That's going to be way worse than the other words that you have about training people and worrying about them leaving. Guys, when you provide the right training and the right practice, don't forget to test it. At Something Fishy, we have kind of a cool concept. Your technician goes through about eight to 10 weeks of training. After that training, they then have to actually do a mock-up route. Our showroom has demonstrations of the majority of the tanks that you'll see in the field are demonstrated in our sort of freshwater, saltwater, reef, complicated, easy, you name it. So we actually have our warehouse team member load up a vehicle as if our showroom and the several tanks in there are a full day's roof. The technician that's in practice comes in the morning and is observed by his manager, goes in the back, grabs the keys to the van, walks on the park lot, moves it 14 feet to the front door, and then goes and cleans the tanks under observation. Between every tank, they get feedback. How can the next one be better? What did I do differently? The nice thing about this practice, they're working completely independently. The person observing can't even talk during the first during the appointment. You gotta wait to the end. Let him let him do his thing, let him fail if that happens, and then teach him after. Because this is mocked up of what it'd be like to be in front of a customer. That is so successful for us in our training. Make sure if you're doing providing training that you test the training to make sure that it works. And then reinforce the training. This is huge, guys. Continuous operational improvements. C koi. If you want to change it, put a K in there to make it easier to remember, like the koi fish. Continuous operational improvements. This is something you want to instill in your team. You want every team member, especially the new team member. The new team member is probably more important than the senior person. The new team member is going to come into your company, see what you're investing in training, and have ideas. Maybe not understand things. Maybe bring new perspective to the table. Make sure during the training you're encouraging Koi. You want them to bring ideas to you. You want them to ask, hey, should we be doing this differently? Should we be adding this product? And one of two things are going to happen. One, they have this idea, 
And you already maybe have the experience to realize that's not a great idea. And you can educate them as to why, and they're like, wow, I'm glad I do that. Other than leaving them just thinking we should always be doing this and they're not doing it my way. Or, and this happens quite often, the idea is actually better than what you thought of because you had a fresh perspective and you can actually implement it. Encourage that in your company and in your team. Coaching is really important both in an informal and formal method. And we'll talk about that in a couple more slides. Huge importance to your company and your training. How many of you have been to an NFL game and watched the entire game, whether on TV or physically there, and never knew what the score was? You never knew what the score was? <laughs> you needed glasses, right? All right. Can you guys imagine going to a game and the entire game you have no idea what is going on from a score perspective? You miss a few plays, you go to the bathroom, you grab a drink, you come back, you have no idea what's going on. Can you imagine being on the field, being the player, being the athlete, and not having any idea if you're ahead or behind? You've lost track of what happened in the first half. You're going out for the second half, and you think you're, are we winning? Are we losing? What's going on? Guys, that doesn't happen in the NFL. That doesn't happen in any sports game. But it's happening in your businesses. How many of you as owners know the score of your, of your business, the score of the game that you're in, the score of the game that you're investing 40, 60, 80, 100 hours a week in? Most of you don't. And if there are a few of you that do, how many of your employees know what the score of the game is? They're investing in their careers with you, and they have no idea if they're ahead or behind. So how does something fishy keep score? The first thing that we do is we actually have open book management practices. You know what? Our entire team is privy to our profit and loss table. Most people think that finances are a scary thing, and they are, until you're educated and trained in them. They're really scary when you don't know what's going on. It's like driving down the road blind. Most of us are running businesses that way. And that's why we can't get to the next level. Now, it's one thing for the CEO, the entrepreneur, the owner to understand their finances. Maybe they're bookkeeper, their finance person, maybe their accountant. But when you open that to your entire team, you know how you are now building brilliant people that can make better decisions in your company. Most of our team members, or none of our team members, other than myself, have a business background. The majority of them are marine biologists by education. All of them have been educated in finances, and none of them knew what a P&L was before they came to us. And now they're working with their P&L on a regular basis. The stats. Our technicians have stats, because we want to know how they're playing, how they're performing. More importantly, we want them to know. It's more important that they know it than we know it as a company. The stats that we look at are done in a proactive way. Before we even send them out on the road, their schedule has stats built into it. When we're building them a schedule, does it, does it set them up for success or does it set them up for failure? Are they going to have a full day or are they going to be waiting around for customers to show up? you got to weep the success, the aspect of building them up to be successful is the, the team's job, is not just on the technician. We look at how many appointments they go on. We look at how long the time that's involved in that. We look at the dollar revenue. We look at how many, how many appointments are reoccurring appointments, non-routine appointments. We look at how many callbacks there are, because that affects your performance, right? We want to be able to study those things. Technician stats are huge. Because of our technician stats and an implementation of paper performance on our team, we are driving some of the highest revenue numbers per technician in the entire country. It's not because we charge more than anyone else. As a matter of fact, we're in the middle of the range as far as what we charge for our services. But because we've driven process and efficiencies and pay for performance for our technicians, they're acting like owners. And that has drastically changed our business and ability to manage them successfully. And they see the stats. On the first week of the year, January, first full week of January, based on the stats that we're showing, we can predict what is going to happen in December, on December 31st. Is that technician being set up for failure, or are they going down, down or are they set up for success? It's really important. We know that today is the beginning of September almost, right? We know how our techs are going to end the year already based on the data we've collected for the first weeks, how the three, nine months of the year. Absolutely incredible. We're not waiting until December 31st to find out if we're doing well or not. We're doing it every day, and our stats are showing that. Sales stats are also important. 
Profit and loss is looking backwards. Profit and loss tells you what you did last month or last year. Technician stats tell you how you're playing the game. Do you have the right people on the team? Sales stats are a future look. If our sales stats, which are how many calls are coming in, how many leads are coming in, how many quotes are delivered that are then turned into sales, how many quotes are delivered that we haven't yet sold, what's that dollar amount? If you're going to be able to close 50% of those, you can predict your future revenue. These are things that are really important. You can make hiring decisions on that. You can make expense cutting decisions on that. You can run your business intelligently. Emergency calls. If you guys are in the apartment service business, this is a word you don't want to hear. If you don't want to hear it, measure it. We analyze every single emergency call completely transparent with the entire company. Somebody goes on an emergency call for some, some widget having a problem, it gets posted so everybody sees it. Everybody can comment on it and say, you know what, here's a way that we could have fixed that and prevent that from happening. When your team knows how expensive emergency calls, most of which you can't charge for, and how it affects your P&L, they start fixing those problems. And they start fixing them without you as the owner even being involved. Guys, this bottle of water, right here, if this was in our warehouse, a piece of inventory, all of you have seen this in any business that you're in. You go into the warehouse or wherever your inventory is stored, damaged, broken, dusty, returns going back to vendors that aren't returned, products, Right, just all over the place on organized. If you teach your team how important inventory is, they start looking at these things differently. If you teach your team that, listen, in order to get this $10 product onto our shelf in our warehouse, we had to take $10 out of our bank account, and we had to put that on our shelf. So stop looking at our warehouse and the products in there as products. Start looking at them as dollar bills, $100 bills, $1,000 bills. And if that was your dollar bill or a thousand dollar bill sitting on the shelf, how would you treat it? Would you protect it? Would, if it fell and got damaged, would you just kick it under the stand? No, you take care of it. So start treating the products in the warehouse like they're your own dollar bills. And our team's doing that. And they're making improvements on their own because they realize that this is something that you want to protect. Inventory can kill and crush businesses. Make sure you're taking care of it. Accounts receivable. None of us want to be in the office changing this. Accounts receivable, if you're measuring it, you pay attention to it. Cash flow to a business is, just, is extremely important. If you're not managing your cash flow, then you can't pay your employees, you can't pay your vendors. A lot of it is because of AR. We don't send invoices out on time. We don't collect on time. We, customers never got the invoice. If you're managing your AR, you can see those challenges. Those things are going to happen. We're a really well-run company. We still get customers that miss invoices. Either we never sent it out, or they got lost in the mail somewhere or it's up in the cloud, you don't know. But if you're following up with these customers and making sure that there's a process to it, then they'll keep up with you. Cash flow is huge to your company if it's important to measure it. And at our fish rooms dubbed our vault. It's where all the gems of our company are kept. It's why we're in business, right? The fish and the livestock are so critical to us. So we actually have a dashboard and stats for that. How many fish are we losing in-house, BIH? How, how much is our shipping? Shipping is all over the place with vendors. How can you control that? Shipping is a huge cost of goods sold uh, on, the, on the fish, and we have to make sure that's very unique than the dry good product in the warehouse. We have to make sure that we're paying the right shipping on that, otherwise the cost of that fish is gonna go up too high, or our losses will be seen later. Water quality, not just water quality in our fish tanks, but how about the vendors' water quality? The vendors are sending us fish. What about inspecting those boxes for water quality so that we have a report, we can track that from water quality received all the way to any issues with fish losses over the next week or two. We can work with our vendors and report back to them how their water quality is. Uh, and if you have a good partnership with your vendors, these are welcome tasks. They wish more people would do it. So let's take a look at the playbook of something fishy. How do we keep all this going? So we talked about coaching and practicing being really important. Here's a look. Once a month, our entire team meets. We're a small enough company that the whole team can get together on a regular basis. In this meeting, we're providing us, what is the strategy that we had for this year? What's the strategy for 2020? We bring everybody and get everybody involved in that. It's the best ideas from your team are going to be everybody. Remember, individuals don't like companies, teams do. Those ideas are really critical, and we provide a platform for them to hear and listen to that. We have weekly huddles so that things in the team meeting get executed out in a weekly huddle. How, how's your project going? Here's what I'm up to. Oh, I didn't even realize you were up to that. You know what, I can help with that. Or I actually already did that. Communication in your company is really important and our hubs are a way of doing that. One-to-one -one meetups. 
This is where on a regular basis, we can, anyone that reports directly to me or another manager, they have a one-to-one. -one. It's the team players meeting. It's a time for them to be able to bring questions to you, to provide a, a great platform to file things during the week that come up that you want to talk about that are not urgent and need to be dealt with today, but can be talked about in this meeting. It is really you know, sort of task oriented. How is how are things going with this project? How are your tanks looking? Those meetings are really important and often overlooked. It's a great coaching mechanism. Not to be confused with one-to-one -one coaching. So one-to-one -one meetups are very task oriented. Like I said, coaching is very future looking. Well, some of the things that we talk about in our one-to-one -one scheduled coaching on a regular basis, if you don't schedule, it's not gonna happen, are things like, what are your future plans, obviously, right? What's the one year for you look like? What's the three years for you look like? Well, from a personal career, what do you want to do in that in that time? Are we the company that can align uh, those objectives for you? If you want to be a babysitter in three years from now, we might not be the right company for you, and we can coach you to get there, right? The other thing that we look at are what are some of your personal objectives? I want to buy a house. I want to get married. I want to have kids. Great. Those are awesome things. They also take a bit of an investment. Can we help you with that based on your your career path? If you're a technician here and you know, your projected income is X, and you're at the house you want to buy, you can't afford that, maybe you should get into being an installer, and maybe you should become a manager. But if you're going to be a manager, you're going to need leadership skills. So maybe we start coaching you that now. So in two years from now, you're making more money because you grew with the company. Maybe you don't want to grow into a leadership role. Leadership or, or management is not for everybody. So we have incredible technicians that may want to be a technician indefinitely. The nice thing about coaching is you understand that and you can coach them properly. The last thing you want to do is take a technician that doesn't want to become an installer and try and get them to become an installer or a manager. You don't want to do those things. Coaching helps us understand that. Tech meetings. Techs are obviously one of the biggest assets in our organization. They're doing the hard work. They're out there working every day and they've got tons of opportunities to learn and improve. So we have regular tech meetings where we can learn from them and get them to share. And then two annual offsites. We uh, want to make sure that the strategy for the company, again, being the size that we are, we can have strategy offsets that involve everybody. So we literally will shut down the training on a Friday or whatever and go out and look at strategy in our organization and get everybody's input because the best strategy is going to come from the team, not the individual. What are the results of open book management? Ownership mentality. How many people want every team player to have an ownership mentality in their organization? Right, and even for you guys that are not in the business but working in a business, don't you want your peers to have an ownership mentality? Don't you want to stop cleaning up messes after other people? Ownership mentality is huge, and it's in our organization, it is a result of open book management because they're making decisions from little things like how much bleach goes in the washing machine. That because of the person that the team player that's responsible for that decided to start measuring the bleach. We saved hundreds of dollars over a year because we started measuring bleach because he was educated on our financial statements and understood what a cup of bleach would cost because of his own doing. That's just one example. I realize a couple hundred bucks may not sound like a lot, but multiply that times 10 or 15, 30 opportunities a year, you're talking about money dropping right to the bottom line because you're implementing ownership and value of the team and instilling that in them. Obviously, a higher level of accountability it's huge being able to know that people are representing your company, talking to your customers, just like you would as an owner. And that high level of accountability is huge. We look, the example of my team coming here today and investing in their own way. They're accountable for their future. They're not just living in the hands of our company. Innovation. There's tons of innovation happening in our company. Listen, we're not a tech company. We're not doing something new that hasn't existed for the last 100 years. We're just finding ways to do it better, improve, and more innovative than the next guy. And these innovations, guys, are not coming from me as the owner of the company. The majority of our innovations are coming from our team, the guys that are working in every day, because we encourage that in our culture and our way of life. It's a huge result of book management. Another cool thing is your team realizes that you're not keeping all the money when you have book management. Let me tell any, all of you, the employees in the room, the owners in the room, if you're not open with what your company costs to operate, everybody thinks that's going right here in your pocket. And instead, the reality is what? That you're probably the brokest one on the team. 
In my 20s, when I was, we were doing even $500,000 a year in business, my salary was $20,000. That's what I made in a year because I kept investing back. I had a tiny little apartment and I only took out of the company what was absolutely needed to survive. Do you think that my team thought I only made $20,000 $20, a year? Absolutely not. It wasn't until we had open book management where they realized that, listen, all of these profits are not going into the, company, the owner's pocket. As a matter of fact, it's not all profitable. There's things that I never even thought about. Our team probably had no idea what, we, what our fish room electricity costs. It's $2,000 a month. That's like 20 times the average household. If you don't educate your team, aren't they just gonna say, yeah, I'll let you go 200 bucks, 200 bucks a month. Maybe double my house because there's fish tanks here. No, it's $2,000 a month for that room. And they know that, they understand the cost now because they're educated. In, in commu uh, communication and transparency is hugely improved in open book management. That is, you, everybody wants that in their organization, and it's really important that you have that, and this is one way that you're definitely going to get it. Obviously, all of these things improve our client experience. We want our clients to be excited, we want them to love doing business with them, we want them to feel the culture and the vibe, and you want them to feel that even when you as the owner are not the one delivering the service or answering the phone. You want them to be excited about it. Those are really important things for the customer, and that customer experience is going to be improved when you have a team that has ownership mentality and accountability. Performance excellence. If you have open book management, you identify it really quickly and you can recognize people. Performance failures, same thing. You're going to, you're going to realize that soon and, and fast. If you have open book management, it's going to come to you quicker. Because everybody's on the same team. Everyone's reporting back, wow, we have a failure that we need to fix it because it affects us. It affects everybody, not just the owner. And that is really important that you can get on that right away and start coaching. So you've got the team in the playbook. How do you keep it all going? It's not easy. The things that we've talked about are difficult. They're challenging. So let me ask everyone to stand up. Stand up. If there's one thing that you learned here today, one thing that as a business team player or a business owner and a coach, if you learned one thing, you're going to implement change in your company, right? Because change is one of the hardest things that you'll ever do. And change and getting other people to change is very, very difficult. So let me help you with this. Everyone take their arms and just cross it like you're standing comfortably. All right. Pay attention to which arm is on top, your left or your right. And then once you understand that, relax. All right, now do the same thing, but put the opposite hand on top. Can't do it, right? <laughs> Uncomfortable, awkward, right? Not the way I do it. I've done it my entire life the other way. So why are you making me make this transformation that's uncomfortable? All right, relax. Put your hands in front of you, cross your fingers with your, yeah, just like that. What thumb is on top, left or right? Now relax, do it the opposite way. You're going to struggle. <laughs> Awkward, uncomfortable, right? Yes. Say yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, any left hand guys or girls in the room? Any left hand? Are you? What's your first name? JR. JR, come on back. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, JR. We don't have all day. Come on, run, run. Yeah, we're making change in our organization. You're left handed, right? Yes. All right, welcome to the stage. Oh, that's weird, right? I thought you were left-handed. All right, how do you shake your hand, right? Why do you do that, JR? You're left-handed. So JR uh, was born like 20 years ago or so? Yeah. Okay. So he was in his 20s, he was born 20 years ago, sometime around the age of two or three. He's left-handed, but he adapted to what society accepts. He adapted from what was comfortable, a left-handed shape, to right-handed because that's what works for society. And today, even though he's left-handed, that's his strong hand, that's what he's going to do everything else with, today, he comfortably shakes with his right hand because he spent the time to practice it that way. And he invested in the change, and now the rest of his life will do that. Thanks, JR. You can have a seat. Okay? <laughs> you have to go ahead and sit down. You have to invest in change. Change, I'm telling you, just, you change the smallest thing from the way you pull out a time card, so where you put the keys at night, it's going to be tough.
Never mind the important things that need to change in your business, like open book management or better coaching. It's going to be challenging. You want to do, implement those things slowly but steadily and make sure that they're working in your company and that everyone's comfortable with them and provide the right training because change is the only thing that will grow you personally and professionally and bring your team to the next level. Because I haven't said it enough, practice, practice, practice. You always have to be practicing. Our team is doing amazing things as, as an organization. And I just met with Billy in the back last week and said, we need more training. We need more, uh, better execution against how to hold people accountable to what they're learning. One way we're doing it is with videos. We said we need more than that. And he's now looking at writing a manual on how to do it because we realize we need more practice. And we need, so my point, it never ends. If you're going to grow your company, you're always going to be practicing and instilling that in your organization. And you need to be the forefront of that as the leader. It's definitely not an overnight success as we've talked. These things are hard, these things are difficult, they're challenging. You are not going to turn your company around or scale it overnight. You start with small changes, and then when you make a change, make sure that they're working. Test them. Don't go on to a new change until the first one you made is working. We talked about this already, measure what matters. Our stats for our technicians are hugely important. Our stats for our sales, everything that we do in our company that's important is measured. If there's a problem or failure or expectations aren't met, I first, before you harp on the team player, I first challenge you to think, is this my fault? Do we not have enough practice around this? Is it, our expectations not clear? If you answer yes to those, show me where it is and then you can go provide the corrective training or put the system in place so it doesn't happen again. Leadership is tough. Leadership is a challenge. So given that, how many leaders do you want on your team? Someone tell me, how many leaders do you got? Present organization with about 10 people in it. JR, how many leaders do you want in that organization of 10? Every one of them. Every one of them, absolutely. Because leaders are not just the people running the company. Everybody needs to have a leadership mindset. Everybody in your organization, everybody on that Patriots team, in order to get to the Super Bowls, are acting with leadership mindsets and performance. Tom Brady, when he sees an opportunity to, to coach or teach at a peer level, he's doing it because he's a leader. And his peers are listening because they're leaders. They're in that position because of leadership. The team we have is something fishy. The reason that this, yesterday's conference was so successful, and I had zero to do with it, didn't even see the, op the practice run last week in the office. The reason that they were so successful is because they're leaders in themselves. And they reach out. I didn't have to say, hey, you have to have a practice run. I didn't have to say I have to prove that. They're leaders. They can figure it out on their own. Where is the coach during every game you've ever been to? On the sidelines. Really tough, but really important. As a coach, yes, you can get into the trenches. You can be there once in a while. You can be in the weeds of your business to understand how things work. The majority of the time, if you want to coach successfully, you need to be on the sidelines and seeing what your team is doing. That is the only position that you ever see in the NFL. The coach isn't throwing the ball. When you're throwing the ball, you can't pay attention to the performance of the team. So you've got to be able to mix that. Some of us are in companies where we have to be out there, we have to be scrubbing the tanks, we have to be doing the books. I get that. But you've also got to take, take time to be on the sidelines and make sure that you're looking at your, your company. You're working on the business and not in the business. Remember, as a leader, your team is always watching you. And the peers are always watching each other. Everything that you do is watched by your team players. They're looking at how you do things. They look at how you dress. They look at how you talk. They look at how you walk. They look at how you're talking to customers. They're looking at what's going on on Facebook, on your Facebook page, on your YouTube page, on your social media. Are you somebody that your team is proud to have as a coach? Or are there changes that you need to make? It doesn't mean you need to run a very sterile, perfect life. God knows I don't. Look at my Facebook. We have fun. But my team knows that we work hard and play hard, right? That is something that is really important. They're watching every move. Make sure you're a leader 100% of the time. And all of us have made mistakes and gone off the trail and not done something that was leadership-like. Admit to it, step up to it, admit it, and own it. And your team will forgive you for that.
bring them into that inner circle. It's lonely at the top. Have your team help you run the organization. And get out of the way and talk about that. All right, this is a cool exercise that we're skipping. If, yeah. And if you want to do it, it's really cool. We can, because of the time, we'll have to do it after. Um, if not, we'll do it next year after. I'm Kurt Harrington, the Fish Guy. Thanks so much for hanging out with us tonight. I hope that all of you learned something. Most importantly, if anything is that you learned today wants to be implemented in your business for change, you need to actually get on your get off your ass and get it done. You have to put in the hard work. Um, if we do, do we have time for questions? We have, we have a couple minutes for answers or questions and answers. Any uh, mics out there? Get some mics, guys. Can we run up and get some mics? All right. Uh, Barry, is it? Third row back? Bucky. Bucky. That was pretty close. Bucky, give me some feedback. What can I do to change or improve from my performance today? But wait one second because Billy's coming up with the mic. Bucky was looking down, hoping he wouldn't get picked up. Where are you from? Why didn't I'm from Lafayette, Louisiana. We have a, a aquarium store over there. Awesome. Do you work in the store? Do you own the store? I work in the store. How long do you work there? Uh, 15 years. What's one thing I should do differently about today's presentation? I don't know. I think you did a good job. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Uh, what's one takeaway that you have, Bucky? To be more of a leader. Awesome. Because how many leaders join in your organization? All of them. All right. Cool. Um, let's see. Uh, we have Paul Anderson, a research scientist at Mystic Aquarium. Paul and I actually work closely there in Connecticut and we're in Rhode Island. So we have the, uh, we're very fortunate to have a great relationship with them. So Paul, just uh, I'd love to hear from you what we should maybe change about today or do differently. What, what can I bring to the table next year that's different or better? Kurt, I think you did awesome. Your talk was so uh, inspirational and high energy and, and I think all really smart uh, points uh, built on exper your experience. Um, I've been studying in project management uh, the past few years and I'm curious about, and I'm curious about your exposure to the project management philosophy and, and if you have incorporated pro any project management principles into what you do because your business is very project oriented, especially with regard to setting up new uh, systems. So that's an excellent question. I, I do not, my team doesn't have any formal project management. However, one of the things that we do, and I'd like to say that we have an opportunity to do better at project management. However, we do manage a number of projects from smaller scale stuff like setting up a 90 gallon environment all the way up through 42,000 gallons of aquariums that we're working with you on right now, right? So our project management skill sets, one, I learned along the way. So I was working with architects, designers, and I was going into architectural meetings in my 20s and had no idea what I was doing. I was taking notes, I was learning. I'd call the architect after meeting and say, what does this term mean? How do I even read this, this print? Um, so we actually went through an entire process, and as we haven't been through formal project management training, we actually have been able to train um, other team players, Billy is one of them, on project management. And we actually, from the time that we sell a job and collect a deposit, all the way through the install, there actually is a project management book or file and checklist that we go through to make sure that everything is done and accounted for, including challenging things that we're not familiar with, like case work and mill work. We, that's not something that we do, but we know what we want out of that. We know that ventilation is important. So we actually have an entire book. Because even though we're going to the professional cabinet maker or the architect, they have no idea what we do. So we actually educate them. So while we don't have any formal training, we actually are very successful in our project management and installs because we've implemented that. I'd love to follow up with you and see about the training that you've done and see if we can learn from that as well. Uh, in the back, we're coming. Uh, you talk you mentioned briefly about uh, uh, commissions or incentivizing uh, your technicians with performance based performance. Yeah. Uh, how, how are you working on that? Awesome. What's your first name? Randy. And Randy, where are you from? Uh, Connecticut. Connecticut, awesome. So you're in my backyard. Um, so I can definitely follow up with you because it's a long conversation. So performance based pay is one of the best things that we've implemented in our company. And I actually wanted to spend a lot of time in today's presentation, but we didn't have four hours to do it. So um, definitely feel free to follow up with me, but in, in brief, our performance-based pay, we took our technicians from an hourly pay and we went to performance-based pay where they get paid based on execution, 
So some of the challenges we saw with hourly pay. Great team players, um, some of the team that we have today were be getting paid by the hour. But performance changed because we instilled ownership mentality with performance-based uh, performance pay. And here's an example. Uh, come in in the morning and need to grab fish for your accounts for the day. Well, I slept in a little bit late, so I'm going to just get that next week. Well, as you know, revenue today is better than revenue tomorrow. So it didn't affect them because they were getting paid by the hour. So whether they sold two fish or one fish or ten fish, it didn't matter. Um, Performance-based pay changed that. The more fish that they deliver, the better their pay is. Uh, same thing with fish food. It drove me nuts to hear from a customer, hey, you guys were just here yesterday and we're out of fish food. Are you kidding me? We either now have to FedEx overnight or drive all the way out to your house for business and deliver fish food. That happens way less today because of performance-based pay, where if they're doing their job and meeting expectations, they're compensated fairly for that. What prevents uh, taking advantage of that and uh, trying to push food or supplies or equipment on your clients who really don't need it? Awesome question. So uh, that is really important because with nothing beats the client experience and integrity. So our culture is fish, fun, irresistible, simple, and honest. And if you don't have that, you can't be on our team. So one is culture, and that's the most important thing. The second thing is that we measure everything. So we know exactly how many buckets of salt should go in your tank. We run um, audit reports on Mrs. Smith's account and can see how many safe and easy bottles were sold. We actually ran a report for a lobster tank somewhere and realized that two, uh, every two weeks we were going through a safe and easy bottle of outside exterior cleaner for an aquarium. That should last about three months. So we actually asked the tech, we said, what, what's, what do they going on here? Oh, that's actually, um, uh, that customer buys that from us to clean their acrylic windows. Unrelated to the fish tank. Right? So, so a couple lessons from that. Oh, when you think you've got something going on, make sure you bring the person that's executing on that into the conversation and don't, don't harp on them. Ask inquisitive questions. I'm just curious. This is something unusual. Why is this happening? Otherwise, if you had gone out and said, why are you overselling this? If we would have been completely off and that would damage the relationship between you and your employee. Um, culture and measuring. Thank you. Alex, thanks for offering to honor our team to ask a question. I love it. Maybe you could talk about performance-based pay and how it impacts you. Well, I am a technician for something fishy, so I have kind of direct experience with the performance-based pay, but it was definitely something that I wasn't used to at all. Uh, I would spend either hourly or salary my entire life. Um, so it was something that was you know, a little scary at first. You don't know exactly how to take, oh, you're only getting paid for exactly what you're doing, but um, you know, over the years it's actually become kind of motivational and like Kurt said, you know, the more you sell, the, the more you make. The more fish I sell, the more money I make. The more corals I sell, the more services I do. So it pushes me to be more efficient and also pushes me to, you know, take more sales opportunities that I may not have thrown myself into right out of the gun. Awesome. Thank you. And, you know, our guys that are uh, in a technician position, the majority of them are marine biologists with a science background. This is not a sales role. They don't have to go to a customer and ask them to purchase anything. That's our, they can if they want to, but this is just to make meeting the deliverables that are expected at the time that we install a fish tank. If we install a fish tank, our customers expect fish food, they expect the tank fully stocked, and they expect their UV sterilizer to be changed every six months. You know, they expect their tank to be performing well. So we're not asking these guys to sell, we're just asking them to deliver on the execution for customer expects. Okay, one more question. We got it, yeah, right in the front, front row. Hold, hold on, I couldn't hear that one. How do you deal with difficult clients? How do you deal with difficult clients? I've never heard of a difficult client. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple of things, really good training. So most difficult client experiences are perception and misunderstanding. So we have something that we're called never give a customer what they want. That's right, don't give a customer what they want. Give them what they ask for. I did that the other way around. Don't ever give a customer what they ask for. Give them what they want. Customers don't know what to ask for. So you have to educate them first and keep, you know, ask why. When they ask something, especially that it doesn't make sense, ask why, 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 and then get to the root cause of it. And oftentimes you end up educating them to the right answer, and they're a lot, they end up getting what they want. I want, uh, can you bring me a shark tank? I mean, a shark. No, sharks. Uh, I'll actually use a more realistic example. We have clients that are regular, but every once in a while, ask, I want a lionfish in my tank. I absolutely want a lionfish. I get anything I want as a client, I get it. I mean, they got wealthy, I love, I get it. I want a lionfish. 
actually, lionfish are not good for your tank because your tank, they'll outgrow it very quickly, we'll have a problem with the disposition, where are we gonna put it after? And when you, and it's not healthy for your system, it's not sustainable, we do sustainable things with something fishy. When we go through our education process with that client, they're like, I have no idea about fish anymore. So a lot of times it's educating them, you know, don't give them what they want, they want a lionfish, or what they ask for, give them what they want, which is an awesome aquarium. On the, on the other side, you're going to get customers that call and they're frustrated. One of the best things to do is just sit and listen. And the first thing I do when a customer calls, if it escalates for me, is I'll have a conversation with them and I'll say, you know, what are the, I'm really sorry about that we have not met your expectations. Keep in mind that our expectations are not met until yours are exceeded. So I want to do everything I can to make this right for you. Can you just give me uh, the highlights or can you tell me what's going on, what's wrong? Even if I've heard what's wrong for my team, I ask them to reiterate it. And then when they're done, I say, is there anything else? Is there anything else that's, that is a challenge right now? And then I go through one at a time and go over how we're going to resolve that for them. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of clients, and we have very, 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 very few tough clients because we can educate them and train them. Uh, but when that does happen, listen, document, and execute to make it right. Do whatever it takes to make it right. Anything else? Yes, JR. How do you handle technicians soliciting customers for the side, a side job? Culture. Okay. <laughs> um, so that is often the question is, how do you handle technicians that might be doing work on the side? Well, one, we have, we do have process and policy in place so that they're not doing, you know, you're not allowed to work um, and drive revenue from uh, cleaning fish tanks outside of our team. It, and, and you can't do that anywhere in, the, in our 